Today is February 10th, 2006. My name is Joe Bruckner. I'm at the Atlanta History Center, and I'm with James Wagner, a World War II veteran who has kindly agreed to come into the History Center as part of the Veterans History Project and tell us his story about uh, his not only his experiences in the war, but his upbringing and his life's experiences, and primarily, though, his experiences during World War II and thereafter. Would you state your name, please? Uh, James Randall Wagner. And where do you currently live, Mr. Wagner? I live in Decatur, Georgia. Okay. And what is your date of birth? I was born uh, leap year, February 29, 1924. Okay. In Scranton, Pennsylvania. Okay. I want to thank you on behalf of uh, the Veterans History Project and the Atlanta History Center for coming in today and telling us your story. Glad to do it. Uh, my honor. Would you tell us a little bit about your upbringing? Well, uh, at the age of three, uh, my father uh, got uh, assigned as a missionary in, uh, we had lived in Scranton until then, assigned as a uh, missionary in Haiti. And uh, so uh, by the Episcopal Church, and uh, he and my mother and I went to Haiti with him. Uh, sadly, uh, about three or four months later, my mother uh, contracted typhoid fever and died there. My father and I, of course, returned to Scranton, stayed there for a few months, and then we moved to Greenwich, Connecticut. And, uh, next uh, two or three years are very happy years. Uh, I uh, lived with my father and uh, went to school there, in elementary school. One of my classmates and closest friends was uh, a kid named Poppy Bush, who uh, turned out to be the 41st President of the United States. But uh, we had a great time. We used to play tennis, soccer, hockey, and uh, had, had good competition together. Then we uh, I moved on to a, uh, my father believed in the interest, uh, the English type of uh, uh, public schools, or over here that they call private schools, and wanted me to go to an Episcopal boarding school where I went for another four or five years. Uh, graduated from there and then I went to Phillips Exeter Academy in New Hampshire. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't mature enough to handle Exeter and uh, flunked out and then went to a school in Hartford, Windsor, Connecticut called Loomis School where the headmaster turned out to be my mentor and got me going and uh, I learned how to study and uh, did well in, in sports. Sports has always been my life, but anyway, I, I ended up being football captain, hockey captain, set the mile record in the, in the uh, mile. And then uh, in 1942, graduated from Loomis, and by then the war had started. And uh, I uh, was accepted uh, into Yale University, and we uh, started an accelerated program. And we were the only class called 1945W, which meant we were going to graduate in 1945 along with the rest of 1945. Well, I had, while there, I uh, joined the Army Air Force and was accepted. And uh, as soon as I finished my freshman year, they uh, called us up and went on to Atlantic City, Oswego, New York, Nashville, Tennessee, uh, and then to Maxwell Field, Alabama, where we started the aviation cadet program. So you, you did not, it, uh, did you volunteer or were you drafted? I volunteered. I mean, it was either volunteer or be drafted. Right. <laughs> and I wanted to volunteer for the service that I wanted to be in. Yeah. I'd always wanted to fly. Okay. I, uh, I remember, the first thing I remember about Flying was uh, being aware of what Lindbergh had done, uh, and uh, we always call him Lucky Lindbergh. Uh, but anyway, uh, went into the Air Force in, uh, I believe it was February of, of 43, and uh, 
ended up in Maxwell Field for, as an aviation cadet, and which was quite an experience. You really learned how to make a bed so that a quarter would bounce off the bed. If it didn't, you got had to walk a tour. And then um, <clears throat> they sent us to a field uh, in Arcadia, Florida, called Door Field, and uh, I was able to uh, check out in this airplane right here. Uh, if you can see it. PT-17 okay. Stearman, uh -huh. and uh, that was my first solo, and uh, had a great time flying that. And, uh, and that was the first plane you threw, you flew, is that yes. correct? Mm -hmm. I did, I, I should say that I got 10 hours in a Piper Cub, but I spent six hours being airsick and throwing <laughs> up, I never really <laughs> flew it. But luckily by that time I got my air legs or whatever you want to call it, and so I was able to keep from throwing up and did very well in this airplane. Well then uh, we went on to, from there, uh, for basic, this is primary training, then we went on for basic training in Bainbridge, Georgia, and then to <coughs> advanced training to Turner Field in Albany, Georgia, where I got, got my wings. Well, then I got orders to report to McGill Field in Tampa uh, and uh, checked out in B-17s and uh, got together with my crew <coughs> and uh, from there we went overseas. Half of us were allowed to fly a plane over, the other half, because we were at the bottom of the alphabet, uh, had to go over by ship. So I went over by ship on the Ile de France. Before you left to go overseas, did you know where you were going, or did they just say you're headed uh, up? Headed yes, we, we knew we were going to England. And was your crew gonna, going to go as a crew? Yes, we were right. together as a crew. And how long had the crew been together in training? <clears throat> uh, we were together about two months in McDale and Tampa. And uh, then we uh, assembled in, the, in the Fort Dix, New Jersey. Uh, then we were, got on board the Ile de France about midnight in uh, that first part of December of 44. And uh, that's how I learned to play bridge. The only, it was the, the storms <coughs> in the Atlantic in that, that, that time of the year were pretty bad. And, and it was, uh, everybody in the ship was seasick except for the boat. Uh, 50 of us who sat up and played bridge all the time, and we had some nurses to play with, so that was, that was fun. It was the only thing that kept me from being seasick. <coughs> but then we got to England and uh, landed in a town called Greenwich in Scotland, and went to an assembly uh, depot called Stone, and then we were assigned to the 95th Heavy Bomb Group in B-17s. Is that the 8th Air Force? That was the 8th Air Force. Uh, we were in the 13th Bomb Wing, which, whose commander was Curtis LeMay at the time. And uh, he was, we called him Old Iron Pants. Or, it was a not so generous name for pants that we called him. But I guess I shouldn't say it on this. You can say anything, <coughs> anything you want to say. <laughs> yeah, we call him Old Iron Ass. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he was. But anyway, he was a good commander, and obviously he was a, a great commander, as, as he showed later. But uh, then I started flying. Uh, first, uh, I, I flew as co-pilot. I remember my first mission. Uh, by that time, there weren't any many Luftwaffe fighters, but there was plenty of flak. <clears throat> and I remember my first mission, I think it was to Frankfurt. Now, were you flying a B-17 at I was that point? flying a B-17. <clears throat> they signed, assigned me as co-pilot to a, a, an experienced crew so that uh, I would uh, get some experience in, in uh, combat before uh, my crew did. And I remember we got about 50 miles away, all I saw was this black curtain of flap. And I said to the pilot, I said, you mean we're going to fly through that stuff? And he said, yeah, hopefully we'll make it. 
<coughs> now, when they were giving you your briefing before you left, did I mean, what was the feeling of your crew, and what was your feeling, just your emotions? Well, uh, <clears throat> I would have to say that uh, I wouldn't say that we were scared, but we were pretty close to being scared most of the time. <clears throat> and I remember we got very superstitious about the clothes we would wear and so on. And uh, usually on a mission, they'd wake you up about 2 o'clock in the morning, and we'd, we wouldn't take off until about 6 or 7. But uh, that was the only time they gave us fresh eggs, and we were allowed to have a good breakfast, because then for, for about 12 hours we wouldn't even have anything to eat. But anyway, <clears throat> After that, on my uh, third mission, January 20th, we were then flying as a crew and uh, took off and rendezvoused. And just as we rendezvoused with the group, I lost my number four engine. <coughs> and uh, should have aborted, but intelligence had said that the target was an easy one, there wasn't much flak, there were no fighters, and uh, in those days you wanted to get all the easy missions you could, because <clears throat> then after 35 missions you'd be able to go home. So the plane, the good, this was from the Roaring Bill. Uh, this was actually, this is a model of the plane you were flying, is that correct? Yes, mm -hmm. this is a model of the plane I was flying. And, uh, the number four engine, had, uh, I had to feather, but uh, amazingly, on three engines, I stayed with the group, and uh, although I could have aborted, but uh, I decided, and it was a very unwise decision, uh, to stay with the, the uh, formation and uh, get this so-called easy mission out of the way. Well, when we got over the target, all of a sudden, I lost <coughs> two more engines, the number three and the number two, and uh, went into a steep spiral. At that time, I was about 25,000 feet, and lost about 15,000 feet before I got it under control. Uh, I told the crew that I thought I could still keep it flying, but uh, if any of them wanted to bail out, they were free to do so. So two of them, the radio operator and the uh, waste gunner, <coughs> both bailed out and unfortunately ended up as prisoners of war. But the rest of us got back across the Ryan River and I was able to set it down in a field near the town, the city of Stroudsburg. Were you in communication with <coughs> any other planes at this no, time? Or? I wasn't. I was just too busy trying to fly the thing. Yeah. And uh, it's amazing to me, in fact, I've talked to a number of guys that I was able to fly at 60 miles on one engine. <coughs> but it was a pretty good airplane. And anyway... Uh, what were the emotions of the crew and the conversation between the crew? And I, I know you were trying to control the plane. Did, uh, did you have time for any emotions? <laughs> you know, I, I have to give them credit. Uh, I didn't have time to talk to them much more than say, I think I can fly it and get across the Ryan River. <coughs> but uh, I have to give them all credit for, uh, because I think if it had been me, I, I would have bailed out. But anyway, they stuck with me and uh, we got across and then we were picked up by some Seventh Army people. Describe the landing when you went down with the, those engines out. Well, uh, I saw a plowed field ahead of me and uh, I just went straight on in. and made as good a landing as I've ever made. It was just a very soft landing and everything was fine. The only thing that was torn up, <coughs> I believe, were the props and maybe a little bit of the undercarriage. And probably, uh, in those days, nobody tried to do anything about a plane that sat down like that. But it probably could have been salvaged. It was such a soft, easy landing. But anyway, the uh, Several of the Army guys took us to headquarters, and the uh, colonel there uh, said that uh, tomorrow there was a C-47 going back to England, and we could uh, he could get us a ride on that back to our bomb group. 
four, and he hesitated. <clears throat> Would you guys like to go to Paris? And I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I said, Kermit, what did you say? And he said, Would you like to go to Paris? And I said, Yeah, I'd love to, but <clears throat> we can't get in there without orders. And he says, No problem. I'll, I'll get the clerk to print you up orders. And uh, you don't have much money with you, do you? And I said, No, just a couple of, a couple of pounds. Of English pounds, and he said, "Well, I'll get you to give you uh, an advance pay uh, in uh, francs, so that you can uh, have some money to spend while you're there." So everything was great. We got on the C-47, went to Paris, <coughs> and stayed there until we were physically and financially exhausted. <laughs> then we went out to Orly Airport and hopped on another C-47 and went back to the base. <coughs> would, would you talk a little bit about your time in Paris, the reaction of the civilians well, uh, and what you did? The, what you, uh, you were, the, the Parisian women were beautiful, <laughs> so much better looking than the English women. <laughs> and at times you thought, my gosh, you know, just a few months before these girls were palling around with the Germans, but uh, c'est la guerre, c'est la vie, c'est l'amour. Yeah. <coughs> About the second day I was in there, in Paris, it occurred to me that uh, my parents were going to be notified that I was missing in action. Oh. <coughs> and uh, so I thought, you know, I better send a telegram to them. And I knew I couldn't say, I'm in Paris. So I said, uh, I knew that they would know what I was talking about. I said, having some wine in the Café de la Paix, wish you were here. <laughs> Signed Jim. Well, they got the War Department program telegram uh, in the morning uh, saying I was missing in action. And the same afternoon, they got my telegram. <laughs> so they knew I was okay. Well, anyway, uh, when I got back to the base, uh, every they, they were they had packed up all my belongings and were getting ready to send them back to the states. But I managed to rescue everything but my cigars, and some quartermaster sergeant had swiped my cigars, but I managed to uh, get along without the cigars. <laughs> anyway, we started flying missions again, and then uh, almost exactly to the day on February 20th. <coughs> on and this is 1945. 1945. Uh, both these are 1945. Uh, Got shot down again. I, I, I think the uh, the target was uh, Linz, Austria, but I'm not sure. But anyway, uh, we lost two engines, and the plane was flying pretty good on two engines. But the weather was bad at the back at the base in England, <clears throat> and so I made the decision. And I, at times, I regret it. I think I could have flown it back. But I saw a nice open field, and I set it down, and uh, everybody got out fine. And uh, the next day, we went back and continued flying. I managed to get in 25 missions before the war was over. Uh, one of them was a mission in which we uh, <clears throat> dropped food to the Dutch right after the ar armistice. Huh. And uh, that was a... Uh, inspiring mission because the Dutch had taken the trouble, this was in April of 45, to spell out <clears throat> in beautiful red and yellow and white tulips, thanks Yanks. And it was very impressive. As we flew over low altitude, of course, we could see it. Well, unfortunately, there were still a bunch of krauts <coughs> there who wouldn't give up. And they shot down one of our planes when we were just flying over to drop food to everybody. Yeah. But uh, anyway, uh, I got in 25 missions, and as a result, uh, I was allowed to fly back in, uh, I think it was around the 1st of May. <coughs> back to the United States? Back to the United States. Most of the other guys had to come back by ship. But I was able to fly back, and then got 30 days leave, and and uh, had a wonderful time in New York. And Let's go back for a second to mm -hmm. uh, your being shot down. Okay. I, I think it would be interesting to know where that was. We've got a map that uh, you can 
and show where it was, and I'll get that on the camera. Maybe you could describe, the, talk about the names of the towns. Yeah, uh, there's a, uh, is that Strasburg? I can't read it upside down. Yeah, that's, that's, that's Strasburg. And I landed probably in a field either north or south of there. It was probably south. <coughs> in an open field just across. I, I probably was within a hundred yard, a thousand yards of the Ryan River when I sat down. Just barely got across. The Germans are on this side. The Americans were on this side. Uh, and there's here's where the Seventh uh, Army folks picked us up in jeeps and, and drove us over to Nancy, okay. where uh, we met the colonel who got us orders to go to Paris. That's an A N C Y, like the name right. of the girl. Yeah. Yes. Did any civilians come out when you got sh shot down, when you landed? Were there any French civilians in the area or did, well, did you it, saw them? it was interesting. Uh, we weren't sure whether we were in enemy territory or friendly territory. So as soon as we <coughs> crash landed, we ran over to some woods and uh, ducked down and, and uh, weren't sure whether we should hide or not. In just a minute or two, a uh, man and two women came along. And he turned out to be an Englishman who had married a French woman 20 years before, and uh, he had his two daughters with him. And he told us we were in friendly territory. <coughs> um, and then the Seventh Army people drove up. The second time, I should mention this, uh, when we sat down, we were picked up by some Army Air, Fo Army Air Force people again. <clears throat> in a uh, open two-ton truck, and this was February and the coldest winter they'd had in France in years. And uh, so, but anyway, we were glad to be picked up and not have to walk, uh, maybe 20 or 30 miles. But after about five miles, we were frozen. <clears throat> and I pounded on the cabin and I said, "There's a house over there with smoke coming up. Let's go in there and get warm for a few minutes." So he drives over, and uh, I walk up to the house, and I open the door, and it almost knocked me to my knees, the odor that came out of that house. And these people were living in this house with all their cattle and pigs and everything else. <laughs> and you can imagine the odor that came at you. And I turned around the driver, and I said, I think I can stand it another <laughs> 10 miles and we drove on <laughs> to the base where they picked us up. <laughs> so that was my two experiences yeah. with civilians, if you want to know. <laughs> now, when you were in England, yeah, you were actually stationed in England. Yes. Uh, uh -huh. Did you get out to the towns at all? There? Oh, yes, or, yes. We would uh, get out to, uh, we were in between Norwich and Ipswich in uh, East Anglia in England. And uh, if we weren't flying that next day, we'd be able to go up to either one of the towns, uh, catch a ride. And that was a wonderful thing about World War II in both, anywhere you were, whether it was the United States or England, <coughs> all you had to do was stand out there in uniform and put your thumb up. Yeah. And the first vehicle that came along would put, take you wherever you wanted to go. And. Uh, Sometimes riding on the back of a motorcycle wasn't much fun, but anyway, uh, we did it. Uh, and then about every two or three weeks, we'd be able to go to London and uh, I spent some time there. And then another favorite place to go was uh, either Edinburgh, Scotland, or uh, Bournemouth, which was on the sea coast. And, uh, were you treated so, well by the civilians in both of those? Oh yeah, we were always well treated. The English were very good to us, they really were. Can't complain about them. Uh, the women weren't very good looking, but uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they were very, very nice <laughs> to us. They poured the storm. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, the English people are wonderful. They really are. I, I love them. During your time, when you were flying these missions, did, did you ever lose any crew members other than the two that no, uh, well, I lost the two who were prisoners of war. Right. 
<clears throat> and then after the second uh, crash landing, I uh, had a young kid, he was only 18 or 19, 18, uh, was my ball turret gunner. And uh, uh, if you can picture how a ball turret gunner is, is in the bottom of the plane, I guess this doesn't show it. Yeah. It does. It, right you there. just lift it up there a little bit. Uh, you've got to sit there in this little confined space. You couldn't be more than about five, six. Otherwise, you couldn't fit in the ball turn. <clears throat> and you'd have to sit there and watch this flak coming up at you for sometimes for minutes at a time, and plus be looking out for fighters. Anyway, he just couldn't stand it anymore. So I, I got another ball turret gunner assigned to me. Wasn't that one of the more dangerous jobs? Yeah, it was. It was, it was a dangerous job. And uh, I was sorry I lost it. By the way, you know, this amazes me because I've got grandchildren who are in their 20s. Uh, I had been shot down twice before my 21st birthday. <laughs> and it amazes me to see young people in their 20s nowadays and wonder how they would have handled yeah. this sort of thing. Yeah. But <clears throat> in a way, I think uh, when you're that age, you really don't, you think you're immortal anyway. Yeah. So uh, maybe that's the best age to go through that sort of thing. So uh, anyway, uh, when I got back, uh, I, was, I thought I was going to be assigned to a B-29 and, and go fly in the Pacific. So you're back in the United States I'm now. Back in the United States uh, in June and July of, of uh, 45 and then August. <clears throat> and was about to be assigned to a B-29 to fly in the Pacific when the war was over. And uh, what was your feeling when you uh, heard we had dropped bombs in Japan? You know, I, 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 I'm sort of reluctant to admit it, but I was disappointed because I really wanted to keep flying. Yeah. And uh, now that I think about it, I can't understand how I had that feeling. <laughs> but uh, I know most people were very happy about it, but I wanted to continue flying. <clears throat> and I know that sounds rather ridiculous. No, not, not at all. <laughs> not at all. But anyway, I went by headquarters and I said, well, now the war's over, what do you got left? And uh, he said, well, <clears throat> we got an assignment to go to the fairing command out of Long Beach uh, to fly B-26s to uh, all over the places. Place, and I said, B-26, that's a neat airplane. So I said, yeah, I'd like orders to go to Long Beach. So I went to, uh, out on the train to Long Beach, and uh, this was an interesting experience for me. <clears throat> when I got off the train, I started walking through the, air, the railroad terminal, and I saw this crowd of about 20 people over in the corner. And uh, they were sort of muttering and yelling. And I went over and looked, and here was this little Japanese family, a man and woman and a couple of children, sitting there, huddled together, and these people were yelling epithets at them. And I was so ashamed of it. Just seems so bad, yeah. and uh, it, it, it's too bad it happened. But anyway, I'll try to. And where, where that. was that? This was in Los Angeles. Los Angeles. <coughs> and you know they interned a lot of the yeah. Japanese in yeah. California because yeah. they were always afraid the Japs were going to come, gonna come over yeah. and bomb them. But there was certainly this uh, bad feeling and antipathy, of course, against all Japanese Americans. And, it was this poor little defenseless family that, that people were yelling at. Yeah. Too bad. Yeah. But anyway, I uh, got stationed in uh, Long Beach and uh, had a wonderful time uh, flying airplanes. And then when we weren't flying, we'd go over to Santa Monica. And one day on the beach, I met a woman that uh, we were attracted to each other and we got married. Wow. And uh, uh, a son was born there while I was stationed there. <clears throat> and then all the flying assignments gave out of gas, and uh, there was nothing, wasn't anything more to do. And I thought by that time, well, I'm going to go back and finish up at Yale. So we went back to New Haven, and I uh, managed to graduate in 1949. And uh, 
then I went to work for a, uh, I might mention that in uh, my senior year at Yale, uh, I earned more uh, running the food concessions at the uh, Yale Bowl and the, and the, uh, bas and the baseball uh, diamond than I earned in my first four or five years. <laughs> really? uh, total yearly salary working for various companies. I earned about five thousand dollars. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Back in nineteen forty-nine, that was pretty good money. Yeah. <coughs> Real good money. So, uh, but anyway, uh, I graduated and uh, joined a company called Burlington Mills, which is a Texas yeah. company, yeah. out of uh, uh, Greensboro and Burlington, North Carolina, and they assigned me to uh, the uh, to Georgia and Florida and South Carolina and Alabama and uh, worked out of uh, Ponte Vedra, Florida, and joined the Florida Air National Guard, <coughs> and uh, got flying again, so it was wonderful. I'd be able to fly and still have a regular job. And in those days, uh, the Guard didn't pay you much money, but they said, here's an airplane, you can fly, and you don't have to pay for the fuel. So uh, we joined up just for the flying experience. <coughs> um, then I uh, joined General Motors and worked for them for 13 years, and I think flying was the only thing that kept me, kept my sanity because working for General Motors in those days was a ridiculous thing. It was worse than the military. Oh, really? And uh, you had a supervisor looking over your shoulder every week, but uh, and it was I believe the stress by going out after work and flying. The, a P-51 or a P-80 and a P-84 and so on, and that we call them F by F-84s by then. But uh, that was my uh, guard, air guard experience, which I did for another uh, 15 years. And when did you retire from the guard? <clears throat> I retired from the guard in 1967. And what was your rank? Our lieutenant colonel. So I'd put in. Uh, 25 years in the military and uh, retired then. And uh, in the meantime, uh, my wife and I had another child, a daughter, and unfortunately the uh, marriage didn't uh, last more than about seven years. And we were divorced. <clears throat> uh, I was given custody of the children, so I learned how to be a single parent. Had that experience, and then uh, for five years I was I was a single parent. We moved to from Ponte Vedra, Florida, to Brunswick, Georgia, and I worked out there for General Motors. And uh, then in 1958, I happened to be in Atlanta uh, doing runway alert out out at Dobbins in an F 84F, and uh, was uh, socked in one Christmas Eve, and uh, went down. To church at All Saints Church in North Avenue, and uh, during that time uh, met a wonderful woman to whom I've been married now for 48 years. Well, congratulations! And uh, no, yeah, it'll be 49 this wow. year. Wow. And uh, <clears throat> she had three children, and together we've raised five children. Wow! And uh, they all got them all through college. Uh, and Unfortunately, my oldest boy died when he was 54, I think it was. But uh, all the rest are doing well. And uh, we now have 14 grandchildren and seven great-grandchildren. Well, I know you're proud of them, but they're proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm proud of them. I'd like to go back and ask you some questions about the, the early days of your, your service. Number one, what was your family's feeling when you went overseas? Uh, their emotions and their feeling about you well, joining up and going over? You know, in those days, I don't, I don't remember. It was just something they, they recognized had to okay. be done. Yeah. And uh, I know uh, uh, I, I really can't describe how, how they felt because uh, <clears throat> I think they just knew that it had to be done. Today, I know people have different feelings about the war, uh, but in those days, we all knew it was, a, it was our duty, and, and we were honored to be able to do it. 
going back even a few more years than that, uh, what were your emotions and your feelings when you heard that the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor? I, I remember it was, it was complete shock. <clears throat> I remember it was a Sunday afternoon, and I'd been out, uh, I think, playing touch football with some guys. And I remember walking back across the quadrangle at the school I was at, and somebody yelled out that the Japs have bomb Pearl Harbor. I couldn't believe it. And uh, we, we wondered what was going to happen. Were they going to call us up next week or were they going to let us continue the way we were? And really for the rest of the school year <clears throat> until June of, of, uh, of 42, things were pretty fairly normal. But then things got tighter and tighter and frankly, uh, we, we in the service live better than most of the civilians did. We have plenty to eat. We never had any problem as far as <clears throat> gasoline or anything like that. And going back to your flying experiences, at what point did you experience the greatest feeling of fear? Uh, I think there were a number of moments when I experienced fear. Uh, I guess the first, I wasn't sure whether I could check out on this thing to begin with, <coughs> and I was able to, and then things rocked along and did well. Uh, then in basic training, uh, <coughs> I was we were doing a night mission and uh, night check out, and. Uh, I came in to make a landing, and my, my, the guy who was my co-pilot uh, forgot to put the landing gear in the right position, and all of a sudden our landing gear collapsed, and we bellied down the runway, and that was a frightening experience. <laughs> but uh, I guess, uh, really, uh, my most unusual experiences were when I was in the air guard outside of the two missions I was shot down in during World War II. <clears throat> One was when I was flying a P P-80 and my fuel tanks uh, didn't operate properly and all of a sudden I was about 100 miles from base from Jacksonville and uh, with about five minutes of fuel. <clears throat> so I managed to settle in and find a small 1,500 foot strip in St. Augustine and set it down there. And uh, they couldn't even, even with fuel, we couldn't fly it out of there. They had to truck it back up to Jacksonville. But uh, I think about it, if I had to do it today, I would have been scared, but I, I was amazed at how I, I had to dead stick the uh, plane in, and I, I did pretty good at it. And I, was, I was in complete control. Um, over the years, I've realized that I was not a particularly good pilot, but I was a lucky one. And <clears throat> certainly, flying that mission, the first mission I was shot down, that was a dumb thing to do. Uh, another time, I was flying this F-84F, and uh, <clears throat> my commander in uh, Savannah uh, would let me keep it down in uh, the Naval Air Station in, in Glencoe in, near Brunswick as long as I would fly the plane up to Brunswick every three days and uh, change planes and then uh, fly, I could fly back to Brunswick and go to work. So I would, every three days I would get up early and fly up to Savannah, change airplanes, and fly back to Brunswick in time to go to work at 8.30 in the morning. Well, one morning I got up there and the only plane they had for me to fly was one with full tanks. My ground crew man said, you know, you're going to have to fly around for about an hour before you can land. And I said, God, I've got to get back to work by 8.30. This was about 7.30. And he said, well, you can't land with, with a full food. And I said, okay. So <clears throat> to myself, I said, I'm going to leave this thing in afterburner and uh, stay about 100 feet off the ground and make a circle, and by that time I'll burn off enough fuel to get to Brunswick. Well, I, I, I took off northeast from Savannah, came around, 
and Brunswick is over here, and I'm going to fly down to Brunswick. Well, a little town called Jessup is right on the, on the way to uh, Brunswick. And I had some friends there, and I said, uh, you know, I think I'll go down the main street of Brunswick and wake those guys up and just give them a thrill. <laughs> well, I come down, and then this is why I say I'm a, I was a dumb pilot. <laughs> anyway, I come down the main street of, of Brunswick, and just as I get over the main part of town, I feel this bump. And I, I, I wasn't sure what happened, and I looked, and I was almost at... Uh, <clears throat> the sound barrier at that time. I didn't realize I was going that fast. Anyway, I felt this bump, and I didn't know what it was. But anyway, I continued and landed at Glencoe, and as I'm landing, the tower tells me <clears throat> that I've lost parts of my uh, fuel tanks. And I say to myself, I better get my little tail back to Savannah. <laughs> so I took off again went back to Savannah and landed, and just as I got out of the plane, my commanding officer meets me at the plane. <laughs> and he said, were you over Jessup a few minutes ago? I said, yeah, I was, Phil. Well, you know, most commanders would say, catch the bus back home, you're yeah. grounded forever. Yeah. Well, this was the most wonderful commanding officer I've ever known. He said, get another plane and go on back. Well, I got back to, to Glinco, <clears throat> I quick got in my car, and I said, I better drive up to Jessup and see what's going on. Well, I got up there and I found out that I had dropped my fuel tanks on the front steps of the city hall of Jessup. <laughs> 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 the only casualty was a guy looked up as I went by and walked into a telephone pole and broke his glasses. <laughs> Anyway, the uh, parks manager at the Chevrolet place in Jessup was in the uh, Civil Air Patrol, and I quick went to him and I said, can you get those fuel tanks and go bury them somewhere so they can't get the, the numbers off them and identify who the plane was? Because my commanding officer was going to cover me as long as yeah. they couldn't identify the airplane. And of course, going by at 750 miles an hour down, <laughs> Main Street, nobody <laughs> saw my number. <laughs> That's a great story. <laughs> so anyway, things worked out and yeah. I continued to fly. <laughs> well, you're, you were obviously more than a lucky pilot. You had a lot of skill if you were able to do things like that and if you were able to get this B-17 back with less than four uh, engines. <laughs> uh, mostly lucky. <laughs> do you ever keep up with President Bush? You said you knew him when he was young. Uh, no, I, you know, unfortunately we've, uh, he's gone his way and he, he's done a remarkable job yeah. and, yeah. and uh, I never got, I did run for political office one time. Really? And um, after I was finished and I paid off my campaign debts, I said to my wife, if I ever say I'm going <laughs> to run again, I want you to put this gun to my head. <laughs> Good decision. <laughs> I had had enough of politics and I admire anybody that can last yeah. through it's amazing. It's a rough occupation. <laughs> yeah. But he's, he's certainly done well, and I'm yes. proud of his son. Yep. Uh, as too. a matter of fact, uh, I, did, I did go to the White House with my, my class, oh. um, <clears throat> and uh, he and, and Barbara entertained us. And, uh, really? We, uh, we had a wonderful time with them one weekend. Uh, oh. We had a reunion there that's and, uh, right. while he was president. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And, uh, Frankly, I don't want to say this, but I'm sort of disappointed in, in uh, how uh, the first George did. Uh, I really didn't feel like he had his heart in it. Uh, I think possibly he wasn't physically well. Uh, he just, you know, he, he, I think he could have, if he had campaigned hard enough, I could have been, I, think, I really believe he could have been reelected. Yeah. But uh, I, I'm amazed at, at the energy his son has. He he absolutely. Is. His energy is unbelievable. A lot of tough and, issues uh, to deal with, I'm too. I'm not sure I agree with every decision he's made, but I think overall he's done a wonderful job, and I'm proud of him. I really am. And, he, he's, his father is. and he's had to handle a lot of tough issues. Yeah, uh, he sure has. Yeah. You brought a number of models of planes that you have flown, mm -hmm. and I'm going to turn the camera around here and pan through them. Okay. 
you're over here? Yep. Okay. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to pan from left to right quickly. Uh, okay. Well, this is uh, uh, AT-10 uh, Beechcraft that I checked out in and got my silver wings in. Uh, this is a T-33 uh, jet trainer where I learned to fly jets. Uh, this is an F-86, uh, really the best fighter in World War II. I mean, excuse me, in the Korean War. Um, this is uh, the F-84D, straight wing F-84, uh, that I flew with the Air Guard. <clears throat> uh, this is the uh, BT-13 that I have basic training in Bainbridge, Georgia. Uh, this is the B-26 that I uh, flew in the fairing command out of Long Beach. In the back there is the AT-6, uh, which was a single engine trainer that I had some time in. <clears throat> That's the P-80, which is the first American jet plane right there. Then uh, P-84 that I dropped the fuel tanks on the <laughs> little town of Jessup. And here's the... Uh, the uh, P-51 Mustang, which was a wonderful fighter plane in World War II. Uh, <coughs> and you flew each one of these planes? Yes. Uh -huh. When you went into the, the Army during World War II, the Army Air Force, and uh, when you were flying over in Europe, did, did you realize that you were a part of one of the more significant events in world history? You know, not really. Uh, uh, I, I know for probably 10 or 15 years afterwards, uh, uh, it never really sunk in. The significance of it probably never sunk in very well. Uh, I never really thought much about it. I remember. Uh, I didn't bother to keep any of my old uniforms, except I did keep my A2 jacket, my leather flying jacket. Uh, but I had forgotten about it, <clears throat> and uh, it had really gotten to, uh, I hadn't really taken good care of it, and it sort of deteriorated. But then a friend of mine uh, knew this uh, fellow who ran a uh, shoe shine place at the uh, Galleria and uh, took it to him, and he uh, uh, really did an excellent job of preserving it for me. And it's on display now at, down at the 8th Air Force Museum in, in Savannah. Oh, wow. <clears throat> Is there anything else you would like to say before we conclude our conversation? Well, uh, uh, I, I'm really amazed that uh, I have so much to talk about. I would like to say that uh, I'd always been interested in, in sports, and uh, I, uh, I, I, there's one thing in my life that I am quite proud of. Uh, I, I started a, uh, a AAU swimming team called the Dynamos. Oh, they're still going. They're, <clears throat> and they're still big going. time. Yeah. And, uh, you started. They've, they've had several Olympic swimmers, and uh, I started that. Team back in uh, 1962, no, 64. Huh. And it amazed me the energy I had at that time. I would coach them from 6 to 8 in the morning, then I'd go to work, and then I'd go back at 6 o'clock at night and coach them for another two hours. And so that I'd make sure they got in at least 4,000 yards every day. Well, I know you're proud of, of that. <clears throat> I'm really proud of that. I guess the rest of my career was spent uh, in, uh, I was in politics uh, for four years. I was executive assistant to the, to the uh, chairman of DeKalb County uh, for four years. And then I uh, managed a solid waste company called BFI of Browning Ferris for the rest of the time. But uh, we've had a pretty good life. Never, I did a lot of things. Uh, Never made any money, but uh, <laughs> but you've enjoyed life. <laughs> I've enjoyed life, and, and maybe uh, maybe you know, I haven't been as serious about things as I should have been. But uh, anyway, uh, life's too short to take it too seriously, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs>
uh, but I certainly enjoyed it. And I'm, I'm thankful for my family, and I'm proud of, every, of the family. I think they've all done well. Well, you should be proud of what you've done, and uh, it's a real honor for me to be able to meet you and hear your experiences. Uh, you, I know what you did for the country during World War II can never be repaid by any of us, and uh, you should, you and your family should really be proud of that, as, as well as everything else you've done. But I, I want to, I want to thank you for what you did for the country. It's my, my, my pleasure, my honor. Uh, it's it's something that we just we just felt we had to do, and uh, it was done. Uh, this goes back to when I was uh, first uh, arrived at my base in England, <clears> the <throat> 95th Bomb Group, and uh, checked into the Nissen hut we were living in. Uh, there were about 12 of us living in the Nissen hut. Uh, it was very nice. Uh, we had sheets and uh, separate beds. We didn't even have bunk beds. But uh, one of the guys had a radio, and we used to listen to... Uh, I don't know what they called it, Berlin Betty, or anyway, it was the, the German radio. And I couldn't believe this. Uh, we were listening, they, they played a lot of American music, big bands and jazz and so on. And uh, then the, the, uh, this Berlin Betty, I think that was what they called her, came on and, and she said, uh, we understand a new crew has just come into the 95th Bomb Group. We want to welcome uh, Lieutenant Wagner and his crew. You're kidding. And they knew about it when I got to the base. <laughs> Amazing. How'd, how'd that make you feel? <laughs> <laughs> I felt like, boy, we were under the gun there. <laughs> they already knew about us. Good <laughs> grief. Yeah, it was amazing the intelligence of the Germans. Yeah, had. it must have been. Uh, we, were, we were fortunate to, to be able to beat them because technically they were far superior to us. Uh, they had developed this ME-262, which was a jet fighter. And fortunately for the 8th Air Force, Hitler wouldn't let them use it as a fighter against the 8th Air Force. He wanted to use it as a bomber. And the, and the plane couldn't fly more than 30 minutes, so they couldn't, it was useless. But finally, the uh, German fighter command under Gen General Galland uh, got control. By this time, Hitler was losing control. And he put up, <clears throat> Galan managed to put up these jet fighters uh, to uh, attack us starting in about the latter part of 1944 and 1945. Well, fortunately for us, they were only able to put up a real attack only a few times in 1945, because I remember on one of our missions, they got up about 5,000 feet above us, we were 25,000, they were 30,000, and about 12 of them just dived through the formation, came up, and shot down 12 of the planes in our group, Gosh. and then continued down, and the only way the 51s could catch them was when they would come into land, when they were slowing down, because there's no way the, fight the 51s <coughs> could catch the jets when they were diving through a formation. So if, if the uh, Germans had used their, their jets the way they wanted to in, say, the beginning of 44 when they could have, I think they could have wiped out the whole 8th Air Force. Wow. But lucky for us, uh, Hitler was as stupid as they'd gone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but those are two items that uh, I forgot to mention. Yeah, that, that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Do you keep up with any of your former... Comrades? Yes, I do. I uh, Unfortunately, my bombardier died a couple of years ago, and my, but my navigator is still uh, around, living out, enjoying the wine country in Santa Rosa, California. Huh. Huh. So, and I'm, I'm going to send him a copy of this. Good. I'm sure he'll be very interested in seeing it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we, we stayed in touch. And I also stay in touch with my radio operator, okay. who lives in uh, Boston, Texas, sometime. Okay. 
and I've seen one of the guys I used to, uh, who was the, one of the lead pilots. Uh, he's living up in Wilmington, uh, North Carolina, and uh, he did well. Retired as a full colonel. And just for the for our record, what are their names? The three men you just mentioned. Okay, my navigator, uh, my, my bombardier was Maury Messenger. My navigator was Mel Hain. <coughs> The guy I flew with, uh, it was our lead pilot, was uh, Bob Newman, and uh, our radio operator, and our, I don't know why I'm forgetting his name, but anyway, uh, I hope he doesn't <laughs> realize I, I've forgotten his name, but I, it'll occur to me as I'm driving home. We can get it included. <laughs> okay. Subsequently. <clears throat> well, thank you again so much, and Thank're again, it's, a, it's an, honor to, an honor to, to know you. Great to, great to be here.